I have found footage of what seems to be me greeting my new subscribers. One of the most fearsome records of human sacrifice among the northern folk is that of the Saxons. Sidonius, a Roman bishop riding as Rome fell around him, sent word to his friend to beware the curved ships of the Saxons, men who were known to have no fear of shipwreck, who delighted in sailing in storms because they could attack their enemies with surprise. The Saxons were known to kill a tenth of their captives before sailing into the sea to please their god. Here's how Sidonius described them to his friend. When the Saxons are setting sail from the continent and are about to drag their firm holding anchors from an enemy's shore, it is their custom, thus bound for home, to abandon every tenth captive to the slow agony of a watery end, casting lots with perfect equity among the doomed crowd in execution of this inequitous sentence of death. This custom is all the more deplorable in that it is promoted by an honest superstition these men are bound by vows which have to be paid in victims. They conceive it a religious act to perpetrate this horrible slaughter and to take anguish from the prisoner in place of ransom. This polluting sacrilege is in their eyes an absolving sacrifice. Sidonius writes as if this is common knowledge, but we have no idea whether or not this is the kind of propaganda and history common of Christians writing about pagans. It could have easily been a bishop just demonizing an already dangerous foe, something that we see time and time again in history, that as soon as people are at war, <laughs> it seems that records start indicating that the enemy is conducting human sacrifice. We see this with the Greeks, the Romans, and even the Bible. It is likely, however, that with the unpredictable dangers that the seas produce, that ritual and sacrifice before taking a long journey would have been seen as justified. So it follows that the Saxons would have made sacrifice. Now, Maybe it was in the way that Sidonius describes. Maybe not. We have the word of Sidonius. We do not have the word of the Saxons. But we do get the sense from this record and others that the seas hold a ravenous god. The Norse called this god Eger, a Jotun of the deep and the devourer of ships. He is called the brother of air and fire, possibly the brother of Logi that we discussed in an earlier video. He is the husband of Ron, a death goddess, and the father of nine daughters who are themselves the waves of the vast ocean. Let's talk about the word Jotun for a second, because it is an interesting word. The word Jotun is most associated with the word consume, or devour, rather than giant, as it's often translated. This suggests that the Jotnar were each devourers of something, or many things, honestly. Logi, for example, is the consuming force of the wildfire. Likewise, Egir is the ravenous force of the sea. And it was said that ships lost in that vast ocean were swallowed by the jaws of Egir. But while Egir was seen as a Jotun, the label God might apply to him just as easily, depending on your meaning, as he is friendly to the Aesir, but is fickle towards humanity. He may grant you safe passage, or he may unleash his wrath upon travelers. Now this digs further into the question of deity in the Norse understanding. Now typically the idea is that the Jotun are not gods, as they are the devourers. Reciprocity is not really seen as possible with them. Though there are heathens today who follow Jotnatru and seek a form of reciprocity with the Jotun. And records like the one just mentioned suggest that there may have been a historical truth to this practice, but it does seem with the evidence that we have that if there was such a practice, it was appeasement, not reciprocity. But obviously we don't know. History has hidden the truth of this through the passage of time. A kinning for him is the spearman, evoking the image of Poseidon with his mighty trident. This would suggest that Eger may have been seen as wielding a similar weapon and was considered a fierce warrior, a fitting image for such a sea god, as the ocean would claim many lives of experienced and hardened sailors. And though Sidonius claims that the Saxons did not fear storms, it stands to reason that their confidence came from their rituals to Eger, allowing them to take risks in storms that would strike fear into a more reasonable man sailing out of the torrential winds towards unsuspecting victims to plunder. Imagine, if you will, surviving a violent storm at sea as a ship carrying valuable goods, only to see the storm settle, revealing the curved ships of the Saxons surrounding you. No doubt, ready to give sacrifice to Eger in thanks for gifts given. But with these risks comes a cost, 
Ships, no doubt, were lost at sea even after proper sacrifice was given. The jaws of Aegir are not always placated, and ships would sink in battles between the Norse and their enemies, or even amongst themselves. Many men would never see the surface of the waters again once they fell from their ships. They would have no funeral rites, no body to burn or bury. These men are said to be tended to by Aegir's wife, Ron, the sea goddess of death. To take the ride to Ron was to drown in a watery grave. And this is referenced in a very late saga called Frithjof's Saga, a story of love and revenge where Frithjof is forced to live life on the sea as a Viking. And in it, Ron is mentioned. Loose now are the storm's grim fetters, sinking down the yawning gap, and angry the whirlpool scatters Ron's pale victims to her lap. It is said of Ron that she captures her victims with a net, riding through the water and ensnaring her catch. She then brings them to her hall at the bottom of the ocean, and it was known to be proper to approach her with a gift, and it was said to be good luck to carry with you gold during your voyage at sea. In the saga we mentioned before, Frithjof, as a storm approaches, hands out gold rings to each of his crew, and he recites a verse as he does so. Gold rings we are taking when we woo the bride. No one to blue Ron rides with empty hand. Chill are her kisses, airy her embrace. But with golden treasure, sea bride do we hold. Ron is not seen as just this unruly and insatiable goddess of death, but instead she is seen as a caretaker. One brings a gift to Ron in exchange for her hospitality. The spirit of reciprocity with the gods continues even in death. Gifts given for gifts received. As we said, those lost at sea do not receive funeral rites. Their bodies are simply left in the vast ocean. Ran collects them. And just as the battle dead might go to Valhall or Folkvangr, the sea dead are cared for by Ran. The story of Thorstein Codbiter, as mentioned in one of my earlier videos about the Norse afterlife, is one of a man who died at sea. And yet seems to have gone on to Helheim and is seen approaching warm fires in the celebrations of his father. His crew, who also died at sea, accompany him as well. So it should be noted that it was not an explicit belief that those who die at sea remain at sea in some separate afterlife sequestered from others. But it is clear that Ron is their caretaker, at least for a while. Beneath the oceans, Eger, framed as a terrible and devouring Jotun, is also a wondrous host. Eagle refers to him as the ale brewer, even as he mourns his son lost at sea. And indeed, stories of him include Thor and Tyr fetching a cauldron for Eger, large enough to brew ale for the gods. And every winter, the gods come to feast in Eger's hall. Such a deity would be a good husband for the goddess of death, who cares for those who die at sea. As Eger's hospitality is then extended to the dead through Ron. Now what this means is open to interpretation. It can extend to the sea dead residing in the hold of Eger and Ron, or it could mean that they simply rest there until they are ready to move on. But the ocean was seen as a source of great wealth and treasure. Sailors could find their livelihood through industry, trade, or plunder out on the ocean's waters. Gold itself was referred to as Eger's fire, because he lights his hall with gold in his hearth. Eger is wealthy, but he shares his wealth as he entertains his guests. And this is why Eger floats between God and Jotun. He can seem like a Jotun in some respects and a God in others. He walks the line between the two. Now, personally, I see Eger as part of my hearth cult or my personal approach to the religion. Ron as well, as I have no problem worshipping death gods. And I think that any heathen who does needs to take a long, hard look at Odin. To me, to follow Eger is to be hospitable to those who enter your hold seeking comfort. Now, I got the name Ocean long before being drawn to Eger, and I can't help but admit to giving him a closer look than others might because of that name. Some might not be interested in having a Jotun as part of their hearth cult, and that's fine. Generally, I hold a similar opinion, but with Eger, to me, it feels right. And that's what matters at the end of the day when considering your practice. But to top this off, I want to end this on an interesting little fact that I found while I was researching. Elsewhere in the galaxy, within the constellation Eridanus, the river, lies a star ten and a half light years away. Around it orbits a cold planet, more massive than Jupiter. And its name is Eger. And it orbits a star named Ron. 
So far, Eger is the only confirmed planet in this solar system, but it would be fitting for Eger to have nine large moons, each to be named after his daughters. But I have to wonder, what other planets rest in that system, orbiting a goddess of death? And with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Hit the subscribe button and send the bell to the jaws of Eger in a watery grave. And remember to find a way or make one.